Today we're lucky enough to be joined by a uh, SET Institute PI, uh, Pascal Lee. Uh, Pascal is a graduate, graduate of Cornell. Uh, he's a planetary scientist. He is, uh, ha has an interest in uh, many surfaces and many planetary bodies, but uh, I think it's safe to say that Mars is his uh, is, uh, dearest love. He is a member and founding uh, director of the Mars Institute. Uh, and he runs, every year he runs a an analog campaign in uh, Northern Canada that he's going to uh, talk to us about today uh, that uh, he's used to develop ideas and uh, new questions to ask about uh, what's Mars's geological history. So if you'll join me in welcoming Pascal. Good afternoon. Uh, my apologies for uh, being late. I thought it'd be easier to find them. Uh, uh, so, let me just jump into the meat of the subject uh, for a slide. So this is the outline. Uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the project, the Help Mars project. Uh, it's named after Help Crater, Meteorite Impact Crater in the IRP. Uh, the second thing is I'd like to uh, just make sure that we, we remind you of what the conventional wisdom is these days about what Mars was like and has been through time. because. My hope is that what I will show you today will change your view of, of how we should think about the Mars. Uh, and that's because we see on Heaven Island many things that do really not just look superficially like Mars, but might have a fundamental reason for being very much like what we see on Mars. So that will be the third uh, chapter. The fourth one will be to go back to Mars and then uh, really uh, convey to you that, in fact, rather than having been wet and warm throughout its history, Mars has most likely been extremely cold and extremely dry throughout its history. If anything, the periods of wetness were exceptional circumstances. But that's not the conventional wisdom. And my hope is that you'll see over time uh, an increasing uh, shift about thinking about Mars in the direction of cold and dry uh, rather than uh, wet and warm. Uh, fifth part will be uh, the discussion about humans to Mars. What is a human mission to Mars? When might it happen? Uh, leading the way to chapter six, which is why would we even want to get humans to Mars? How will they go there? What will they do there? And who will go? Finally, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our project's future. Next slide. So the project first. Well, many years ago, I was trying to find a place on Earth that had all the ingredients of Mars, either volcanic terrain or impact crater. And it all had to be cold, of course, in some sort of a freezer of time, so that we could try to see what types of processes were operating. Now, this is a map of the well-established terrestrial meteorite impact craters. Uh, the only one that is set in a polar desert, an environment that's cold, dry, Windy, uh, unvegetated, unpopulated, rocky, dusty, is how the crater. Nothing else comes close. There's a crater in Alaska, but it's mostly in tundra. There's another one on the Arctic Ocean floor off the coast of Norway that doesn't count. It's too wet. <laughs> so there you have it. Next slide. So we went uh, for the first time to Devon Island uh, in 1997. Other people had gone there before, of course. Uh, it's, it's in Canada. Uh, Devon is the largest uninhabited island on our planet. When you're on Devon, you are the population of Devon. <laughs> <laughs> you get there by flying a jetliner to Resolute Bay. You usually have to wait for a day or two for the weather to improve. And then you hop over to Halton Crater on the Twin Otter uh, and you get to our camp. Uh, note that the uh, eastern half of Devon Island is occupied by an ice cap. It's a remnant of the uh, Laurentide ice sheet that used to cover the bulk of North America uh, 10 to 8,000 years ago, slowly receding away. So all these seaways and all West Passage and all that, that was all covered under ice uh, 8,000 to 10,000 years ago. Okay, 
indeed it was being dug out by, by ice flow as well. Uh, so this is Devon Island today. And the closest community is Resolute Bay, 250 uh, permanent residents. And the second closest is Greece Fjord, the northernmost uh, community in, uh, in the world, actually. Uh, and Greece Fjord uh, has a population of 180. Uh, we are somewhere in between uh, on the northwestern rim of Halton Crater. This is our project's research station, Halton Mars Project Research Station. We were alone on Devon Island uh, until about two years ago when the Canadian government has decided to reassert its sovereignty in the high Arctic and has now established a, a monitoring station. And I think it's just about two or three people only uh, in the summer as well only uh, to, to monitor the traffic in the Northwest Passage, which runs right here. This is the entrance of the Northwest Passage and then you sort of make your way through the islands. Okay, so at Gascoigne Inlet, they have a few huts uh, so we're planning on uh, attacking them from <laughs> Next slide. Uh, I us go back one slide real quick. Uh, this is Beachy Island off the coast of Devon. It's actually connected to Devon by, by a business. Uh, Beachy Island is the place where graves from Franklin's expedition uh, were first found. Uh, Franklin, as you might recall, left the uh, England with two ships, 127 men all together, uh, they were never seen again, none of them. And uh, the first uh, bodies that were somehow found from that expedition were buried here off Beachy. Uh, it was established many years later, in fact, uh, in the 80s, 1980s, uh, that uh, most likely the fate of the crew was that they all died uh, of lead poisoning. Uh, in fact, this is sort of an uh, irony uh, the Franklin's expedition was very well equipped. They had plenty of resources, and in fact, it was one of the first sailing expeditions that had canned food. They were in a rush, they were late. The canning process wasn't done properly. Some of the lead that you could use to seal the cans seeped into the uh, food. And over time, uh, as you know what happens with lead poisoning, the, uh, the crew became, uh, essentially lost its mind and, and was unable to function. So it's believed that bit by bit the crew became essentially uh, prone to dementia and, uh, and lost its way. And, and of course, eventually some bodies were found on the King William Island, much farther south. And it's look, it looks like once the, the ship uh, ran ashore, uh, they tried to walk south, uh, dragging boats and ships, and eventually were uh, all died eating uh, each other and then eventually getting eaten by polar bears. So it was a very sad story. Beachy Island is is uh, is this connection that we have on Devon Island to, to to exploration. The irony is that new technology will only work for you only if it's mature. Okay? It's this whole TRL level. The canned food was at a low TRL level. It had never been really proven uh, in flight. So here are some of the graves. Other graves were added later from other expeditions, but two of them are from Franklin's expedition. Next slide. So this is Halton Crater. It's a 20 kilometer meteorite impact crater. Next slide. Uh, it formed 39 million years ago. It's been redated, so you will see on the website sometimes 23 million, but that's, a, that's an old date that floats around old pages. It's actually been redated now. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an Eocene uh, impact instead of a Miocene impact. And the impactor itself, we don't know what it was made of. In fact, there's some who collected some rocks in the hopes of uh, determining its comp the composition of the impactor. The impactor, if you assume an average impact velocity of about 15 to 20 kilometers per second, uh, would have been approximately half a mile in size, maybe about a kilometer. Okay. So, uh, that's quite a piece of rock, but it did not lead to global extinctions or anything uh, of a global impact, uh, although dust might have been actually thrown all over the globe. Uh, what certainly happened, though, was regionally was, it was very bad news, uh, and, and it devastated the, the surrounding terrain. Uh, so our base camp used to be here inside the crater for the first three years, and then we eventually moved it uh, to the northwestern rim, in part to spare the environment 
driving around with ACVs and wanted to protect the equator. Uh, this very beautiful light colored material that you see in here is impact breccia. It was semi molten at the time of impact, and it's made of a complete crushed up mixture of all the rocks that were penetrated by the impact all the way down to the base of Devon Island. Devon Island has a relatively simple geology otherwise. It's essentially a slightly tilted layered cake. Right? Each layer was an ancient marine seabed. And down at the bottom, about a mile deep at this location, you have the crystalline basement of Devon Island with granites and gneisses. Okay? So the crystalline basement is about two and a half billion years old. The stack of seabeds above it ranges from 500 million or so to, to about 300. They're all slightly tilted to the west. You don't see the evidence of the tilting here too much, but in the next aster image I'm going to show you, you'll see that these, there are bands of different composition running roughly north-south, which are essentially different layers of the cave being exposed uh, from this slight tilt that, it, that this whole layer has. <coughs> this material in the middle is extraordinary. It's, once again, it was semi-molten at the time of the impact. Uh, it really looks like regolith. It has bits and pieces that are different ages from the different layers that were excavated. And you can find around, as you walk around the inside of the crater, you can pick up bits and pieces of the basement of Devon Island. Uh, chunks of rocks that have been dredged up from over a mile deep by the impact event. Uh, the impact, it's believed, took about, uh, well, split second across the atmosphere, uh, but the, the development of the crater cavity is believed to have taken about 10 to 20 seconds. Okay, so it was essentially opening up at about one kilometer per second to <coughs> up all the way out there. And uh, the ejector, of course, was, was in place and uh, draped all the surroundings. Much of the ejector now is gone. And in fact, we believe that none was left until uh, two summers ago when we found some. Next slide. So this is just the aster image in the thermal infrared showing you uh, the Mediterranean image. But I'll just move on to the next slide. So this is what you might see if you were to approach the crater from 10,000 feet of altitude here from the south, looking to the north. Next slide. That's where our camp is, HMP research station. This is the impact, uh, of course, uh, being sort of depicted by an artist. Next slide. And this is sort of a better view of this impact event. Uh, at the time, it was believed to be a Miocene impact, so the vegetation reflects a Miocene vegetation, including also the Miocene fauna, the giant rabbits of the Miocene. But it turns out that the Eocene had its own giant rabbits as well. So this remains uh, generally true. Note that the Arctic at the time had not just conifers, evergreens, but also the seedless trees. Uh, all of the Earth was quite a bit warmer, okay, much warmer than it is today uh, in the Eocene and uh, later in the Miocene. Here's a map of our camp's location. You can see the northwestern outline of the impact structure. It's not a very well-defined rim because uh, the crater's old, for one thing, and then the other is when you talk about large impact craters, uh, the, the rim becomes sort of a fuzzy thing compared to a crisp rim that you might find at a small, simple crater, like meteor crater things. Uh, but each square here is about one kilometer on its side. You can see our little airstrip very near it, uh, our base camp, HMPRS. Okay. And a number of features were named over the years, uh, parochially, after things that we're familiar with or after uh, the space program or our academic partner. So you have, of course, the City Institute Hills. I'm not sure I've ever mentioned that here. Management, but they exist. There are NASA Ames Hills up there. Uh, that's the NASA, NASA Astrobiology Institute Valley. Uh, this little pond here is not named. NASA Astrobiology Funding Pond. <laughs> <laughs> it's very shallow and dries up. <laughs> okay, this is uh, the location of the FMARS, the facility of the Mars Society, which we uh, helped build back in the year 2000, uh, but I'm no longer uh, working with or associated with. Uh, there's some trails all over this area, but here are some main ones. This one, this main one that enters the crater. Uh, is NASA Road 1, uh, and there's NASA Road 2 heading out to the north uh, as well. Okay, next slide. 
So how do you get up there? Well, you put your cargo on a C-130, and uh, immediately the parts out of Moffett Field, although uh, for the last few years you've had the support, the excellent support of the International Guard from Long Island, New York. Uh, go figure. Next slide. Uh, this only takes you and your cargo to Resolute Bay, uh, but then from there you have to funnel everything into Twin Otters and, uh, and fly into camp 2,300 pounds at a time. Uh, all your cargo and equipment and people, looks like. So this is what the camp looks like from the sky with a couple crate on the horizon, next. And our camp as it stands today. Uh, so we have the core, which is mainly a, a storage facility for now. Uh, we have our mess tent, which as you can see from the size is the most important feature of the camp. <laughs> uh, the workshop where we fix ATV, a science tent where the students and researchers are parked. Uh, the medical tent, uh, which is actually quite nicely equipped in the summer. The CSA, the Canadian Space Agency module. Uh, our office tent, which is essentially the command center. Uh, the systems tent, where the computer networks are uh, operated from. And this is a new tent, which was added this year, the RADSOC. It stands for Remote Advanced Destination Systems Operations Center. It's intended to be a local mission operations group. Uh, and part of the reason we have that there is because it's not always easy to get communications from the field all the way back down south by satellite, especially if you want to emulate the high data rates you might expect from, from the moon to the Earth directly or from Mars to the Earth directly in the future. Uh, it will be quite easy actually from the moon or, the, or Mars to send large amounts of data back to the Earth directly because you just essentially shoot it to the Earth. We have to send a lot of data from the polar region of the Earth to uh, to a geostationary uh, satellite uh, down down south, we're actually quite limited in, in the amount they need to pipe through. So part of our future uh, operation scenarios will require that some obstacle will come up to them an island and operate on the, the RADSOC, the mission control, if you will, uh, on site. This is a storage tent, etc. Next slide. Does anybody sleep? Ah, the, this is downtown. This is the red light district. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's, it's happening. There's power all day long. There's wireless internet. Okay. Uh, we, you need to walk about uh, 300 meters to the northeast to Tent City, where you're now sleeping in your own personal tent. Everybody comes up who comes up there has to sleep in their own personal tent. You don't want to do that. You should be coming to the field. It's the sort of thinking. Um, it's worked uh, quite well so far. Uh, Tent City is a quiet environment. You have wireless, mind you, because it sort of shot bathes in the whole camp area. But, um, but otherwise, this is the happening area. So you will have desk space, uh, office area. Of course, we are hoping to expand in the, in the future. In fact, one tent at a time every year, typically, uh, without necessarily turning this into a, a city. So we have a fleet of ATVs. ATVs are very important to us. They are not just vehicles, they are actually research tools. I sometimes uh, throw at uh, new arrivals this funny analogy. A microscope will allow you to zoom in into uh, the information that you're interested in in your microscopic slide. And an ATV will take you to the outcrop, sort of the macroscopic microscope. Uh, it takes you to the information, to the data, and without the ATV, you are very limited in the range you can cover over the course of a few weeks in, in, in an environment like that. So you have to be back in camp really. Uh, so we have a fleet of about 22 ATVs, uh, half of which were donated by Kawasaki uh, Motors USA. Uh, this is our men's room. I've shown this before. In case you weren't not familiar, you need to step up to the occasion on the cooler, and then there's a funnel, which is the active funnel, <laughs> and it allows you to, to also do it in an empty fuel drum, and then we ship out the fuel on, on empty planes that fly back to us the day. Uh, we don't go to the bathroom in this terrain because the, the ground is actually poor in nutrients like nitrates and phosphates. Uh, and a good proof of that is that when an animal dies, this is the case of an Arctic fox that died at this location, uh, its organic remains just seep into the ground and eventually just turn into a patch of moss. In fact, when this uh, animal was first found, you can still see the legs, the outline of the legs and the body, and the tongue was sort of disturbed a bit. But uh, anyway, 
I always tell the same joke, but here it is. It was a bad fox because it reincarnated into something less. <laughs> we also had polar bears to contend with. I'll go into that in a second, but uh, that's closer to the coast. And sure enough, here we are in the canyon lands uh, with the coast next slide. Uh, with our polar bear guard dogs on red alert, and then our <laughs> <laughs> local teenagers that we hired from the from Resolute Bay or Greece Fjord uh, to help us keep an eye on wildlife, excluding ourselves. And then uh, here you have the configuration of the camp in winter. Uh, we have not occupied the station in the winter per se. We visited it, we even spent a few days there, uh, but we never really had a sort of a serious occupation of the facility in the winter. Uh, but this. This has become a possibility uh, if, if we had the resources. And there's interest, in, interest at NASA uh, these days for actually dedicated isolation experiments, uh, not just the opportunistic studies you can do with Antarctic stations or submarines, which are opportunistic. Here you would have an actual crew of trained people who be isolated on purpose for six months to a year uh, in the field with field work to do. Uh, so there's interest in that, and we hope that uh, how we will support this kind of activity. Next slide. So it's a big team effort, and I, I have to emphasize that uh, I've been uh, very blessed uh, to be associated with a lot of good people and support over the years. Uh, without going into a lot of details, NASA has a cooperative agreement with the SETI Institute, which governs my work here. Uh, I also get occasionally some grants with NASA. Uh, some of it gets contracted to the Mars Institute. The Mars Institute handles the logistics of the project. Uh, SETI Institute is where I keep the science. Uh, the exploration work that had more to do with human exploration, sometimes robotics, tends to go to, to the Mars Institute, although it straddles both uh, institutes, really. The Mars Institute is established both in the US and in Canada, and the Canadian side of it gets contracts every year from the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, we don't get contracts from NASA, so uh, we are essentially in a cooperative uh, relationship with NASA when we do work up there. Whereas for the Canadian Space Agency, we're in the position of having to deliver a service. So what the Canadian Space Agency wants from us, uh, Mars Institute, is, is to support uh, Canadian researchers that the CSA selects uh, and, and has come up there. We ourselves have academic, academic, par academic partners, in blue the US ones, and red the Canadian ones, and gray the others. Uh, everything that's red here is Canadian, everything that's blue is US. Uh, corporate partners, if you have a business, you want to feature an interesting uh, piece of technology that could help us, then you might consider becoming a corporate partner of our project. Uh, we have interface with quite a bit of Canadian government uh, entities, we have education partners, mostly in the U.S. as well. It's actually hard for our project to have schools because uh, we are up there in the summer, and of course schools are out, but uh, we do have, uh, nevertheless, some contacts with, with the schools and uh, otherwise visits throughout the, the rest of the year. Next slide. So this is our greenhouse, which uh, for the past few years has supported or hosted an experiment led by the Canadian Space Agency, and so we sort of rented out to the CSA for them to do uh, an experiment on autonomy. And they succeeded uh, last year and continuing this year in operating this greenhouse completely remotely from down south. Okay, so there are plant growth trays that are watered in the spring, uh, others are left to die at the end of the fall when there's a gap in power. Uh, otherwise, the rest of the year, the greenhouse run by a combination of wind turbines and solar power, uh, batteries serving as a buffer. Uh, so it's a pretty nifty project. And it, it goes to show that it's not that obvious to, to really make something grow year-round uh, in an environment that's, that's still very terrestrial. Next slide. All right, so what's the conventional wisdom about Mars? Next slide. Well, we, this particular slide is very important. It shows you two key things that have led to this whole idea of early Mars being wet and warm. One, that the impact craters on Mars are not as crisp as the ones on the Moon. Therefore, there was weathering going on, and the assumption here was that well, weathering was substantial, and it must have rained on early Mars. The other observation is that there are these valley networks, which superficially look like the valleys that you see out uh, on the hills near you know, us, and therefore imply that liquid water was flowing 
And the, the buried assumption, which is not often realized, is that the liquid water was flowing under open air, is the assumption. And because these valleys don't seem to indicate a massive flood of any kind, we're talking about water flowing at a trickle of sorts. In other words, a slow running stream. And for that to be possible, you absolutely need a thicker atmosphere on Mars, and you need somewhat warmer temperatures. If you were to release boiling water, let's say a source area here on Mars today, and allow the water to flow, it would freeze up within the first kilometer. This is a scene that's about 60 kilometers wide. So for, for this to be possible, with water flowing at a trickle under open air, you need a thicker and a warmer atmosphere. But is this assumption correct? Next slide. This is another uh, key piece of the puzzle. Uh, Mars also has these outflow channels that are a lot more catastrophic in nature. You can see that something happened here and released a huge amount of water with a torrential flow. There are streamlined islands, all kinds of uh, flow dynamic features. Uh, these are water features that do not require a warm climate. Or in fact, they do not have any requirement on the climate because they are catastrophic in nature. If you had a reservoir of water that somehow was heated underneath the ground and was somehow allowed to be released onto the surface, uh, it could flow hundreds of kilometers, uh, provided it's a large, it's large in supply and provided the the outpouring is catastrophic. We're no longer talking about water flowing at a trickle. So because of the catastrophic nature of these outflow channels, they don't really have a constraint. They don't, put, they don't really put a constraint on climate. Next slide. And then we have these very intriguing features, these gullies, which were discovered only by Mars Global Surveyor. Uh, and of course now, if you look back at some Viking images, you start seeing them as well. But uh, nevertheless, the, and clearly evident as gullies only in recent times. And sure enough, these are telling you that liquid water most likely flowed on Mars in recent times. There's no doubt about that. And that's because they are not very difficult to erode, uh, not to mention that they are on slopes. Uh, and so for them to be still there, they have to be relatively young. And number two, they, they just look very fresh and very crisp. Okay? And so so hence the idea that liquid water has been flowing on Mars in recent times. So there have been two key hypotheses that have been floating around the literature ever since these things were discovered. First of all, the, the Nature paper that announced, the science paper that announced this discovery uh, only went for one hypothesis. Okay, I just want to point that out. I was always taught in school that you have to approach geology with multiple hypotheses. But that very famous paper had just one hypothesis, which was that water came out of the ground uh, it somehow made its way through 70 kilometers of permafrost in that area uh, and flowed out and then of course eventually sublimated. Uh, so that uh, was a problem from a number of standpoints because you needed a high thermal gradient, in other words a temperature increase slope uh, with depth, which you know might be possible in one area but uh, we were seeing all over the place so it's really difficult to, to assume that it could apply elsewhere uh, generally. The other hypothesis was that, which was suggested later, is that these are the result of ground ice. So the ice and the water is already there in the, in the ground, but it's just that it's melting away uh, and resulting in this. And based on our observations in the Arctic, uh, that's also unlikely to be the reason, next slide, the cause of these problems. So the conventional wisdom goes this way. These are the key observations so far. The highly craters are weathered. The valley networks involve slow water flow. The gullies formed in recent times. The basins with smooth floors had lakes. I can show pictures of that. The northern lowlands have shorelines and had an ocean. The Mars Exploration Rovers found that there are acres records at both sites. All of these have led to the conventional wisdom that it rained on early Mars, the climate on early Mars is warm, the aquifer from water flow and subsurface ice melt. Uh, were the two hypotheses for the gullies in recent times. The warm climate on Earth, warm climate on early Mars, warm and wet climate on early Mars, warm and climate. So I think you get the picture. Uh, it's all consistent uh, at this point with a warm and wet climate for sure. But there's additional evidence that is somehow overlooked in these conclusions, and we'll get to those in, in the next slide. But basically, 
the conventional wisdom has it this way. Early Mars had a wet and warm climate. Throughout Mars's history, you also had a wet and warm climate every now and then. And even in recent times, you had a wet and warm climate to allow uh, the gullies to flow uh, onto the surface if you assume that it was from melting ground ice. Okay. And I want to be sure that you realize that this is the picture that we have of Mars today. Uh, if you go to conferences and workshops, this is what you hear. Okay. Slide. That's the picture you might envision. <laughs> it's a very Earth-centric picture. Slide. But there are major issues. First of all, at the time of early Mars, the sun was 25 to 30 percent dimmer than it is today. It's this is a well-known problem, the faint early sun paradox. <coughs> if the sun was faint, how could Mars, especially being farther than the Earth from the sun, uh, than the Earth from the sun, and being early Mars, how could early Mars be, be warmer than it is today? <coughs> climate models, for sure, have had extreme difficulty making early Mars' climate wet and warm. They've really struggled. Uh, the solution that has been achieved is to invoke a 2 to 10 bar atmosphere on Mars. So our atmosphere is one bar, and we need an atmosphere that's twice to 10 times thicker than on the Earth. Uh, made of CO2, uh, you have CO2 clouds as well that help the greenhouse warming on the ground, then that creates a problem of reflecting sunlight away. Uh, so that's not very well uh, worked out. But in addition, uh, where did all the CO2 go? You cannot just dissipate or lose by exospheric escape 10 bars of CO2. <coughs> uh, so the hypothesis is that it went into carbonate. Somehow there were bodies of open water on Mars. CO2 over time dissolved into it. And then sure enough, you ought to have major amounts of carbonates on Mars. It turns out that we see some now, but not a lot. And then the third possible major issue is that a lot of these analogs, for example, comparing the valleys, the valley networks on early Mars with the random valleys out here in the hills, are actually poor analogs. And geomorphology is a powerful tool, but it really has to be used with caution. Next slide. So, chapter three, let's go to Devon Island. We use analogs for a number of reasons for science exploration, they have a certain number of functions. We to test things, to learn, to train people. All of these are different functions. Uh, ultimately, what makes the value of an analog is a combination of these factors. What functions does it serve? What applications does it have? What aspect do you consider uh, is of importance? Uh, Antarctica, for example, is very cold and dry, so it's a good climatic analog to Mars. But it's not really a very good uh, uh, geology analog, actually. There are no craters. And although there are volcanic rocks, uh, they don't really have a regolith as you would have on Mars or on the moon. So it's a relatively poor analog geologically, although it's good analog climatically. And depending on what you are after, and an analog could be good or bad. Certainly, Devon Island is not perfect either. The first reference to the polar regions as an analog for Mars comes from uh, Douglas Mawson, who was a famous uh, Australian polar explorer. Uh, outside, he was describing Antarctica. Outside, one is in touch with the sternness of nature. One might be a lone soul standing in Cambrian times or on Mars. All is desolation and hard and dangerous. And this was done in 1912. This was said in 1912. So, what have we learned from Devon Island uh, about Mars? First of all, this is how the crater. We know its age. We know what the climate has been doing on Devon Island past 39 million years, uh, it doesn't rain a lot. It's mostly, it has been mostly a cold and dry climate for most of the time. And in spite of that, it is far more eroded than craters that are at the same size that are at least two and a half or more billion years old on Mars. So even though the craters on Mars are somewhat weathered, they are really not heavily weathered. And that's the key thing too, to really get out of this simple comparison slide. Sapping valleys. The sapping valleys on Mars, which are believed to form by the headward erosion of these valleys. In other words, uh, the valley grows by exposing ground ice, which then, once it escapes, makes the ground collapse and the valley grows towards the source. We're seeing some of these things happening, but in very fractured and broken up terrain inside the impact branch deposits and help the crater. This is actually how these valleys are forming. They are forming by ground ice getting exposed and the terrain losing its structural support 
and as the ice melts away. Next slide. Then we have these valley networks. These valley networks on Mars and on Devon Island, okay, are now very similar in morphology. We're not talking about a superficial similarity with the valleys and the hills here. We're talking about something that's really startling in similarity in scale, but also the fact that there are odd features like these giant islands that are isolated. Valleys up in the hills never reconnect. You don't form islands. You form islands in uh, floodplains like the Mississippi River. Okay? That's where you form islands in, in river valleys and on the earth. Never as it's uh, in a other uh, in these other types of valleys. Meanwhile, you do see these giant islands on Mars. So the, the stream splits apart and comes back together. Uh, they also seem to spring out of nowhere. On Mars, and sure enough, same thing here on Devon. So we went, of course, to the source areas. What's happening here? Do we see water coming out of the ground? Is there a source? And there's nothing. Okay. There's nothing. Next slide. And in fact, what these valleys are, are glacial meltwater channels. They were formed underneath an ice cover by the melting of the ice cover from its base. And we know that because, in fact, if you hike down some of these valleys, you will every now and then go uphill. Okay. Water on the earth never goes uphill. It always goes down <coughs> gravity vector, okay, gradient. You only have water going uphill in three circumstances in geology. Ah. Uh, lava tubes, that's because it's a uh, getting the term. You, have confined flow. Okay, so lava tubes are a case of confined flow, and just like in plumbing, water will go up a building because it's confined in the tube. So lava tubes are a circumstance where the flow can actually go uphill and gains gravity. Another circumstance in terrestrial geology where you see water going uphill is karst, okay, um, underwater uh, water <coughs> circulation in, in limestones, for example. Okay. Again, that's a case of confined flow, the same as plumbing. The third circumstance on Earth is subglacial flow. The ice cover is serving as a lid. Uh, the ice is melting in the case of Mars from the base because the ground is warm. The planet is young. It had impacts. It's got volcanism. It's got a high geothermal gradient. Uh, the ice cover is melting from the base. And the water is essentially flowing uh, downhill for sure, but confined by not just the capping of the ice, but by where the edge of the ice cap is. This here is what we see today at the edge of this ice cap I was talking to you about on Devon Island. As the ice cap is receding, we're now exposing for the first time in 10,000 years uh, valleys that were formed underneath the ice cover from the melting of the ice. And that's why these valleys seem to spring out of nowhere. There is structural control, which is often an argument that's made about these valley networks of Mars. But the structural control is not from the bedrock. It's actually, in the case of Devon Island, from the configuration of the ice cover. It's the edge of the ice cap that is controlling uh, the edge of the ice cap, the, the flow of the ice that's controlling the, the direction of these, of these valleys. Uh, another example of what has been interpreted on Mars as being due to liquid water flowing on the open air, and therefore you have to have a warm climate in canyons. Okay? The thinking here is that water is released at the head of this canyon, somehow flows down the valley over time. Just like we have in the case of Grand Canyon, uh, the water, uh, open, stream water, opens up a big canyon. But this is not at all what's happening here. And this is a canyon that's of the same scale and has the same basic morphology as, as this canyon on Mars. These canyons are, are glacial canyons. They're not at all formed like Grand Canyon. What happens on Devon Island is that the bulk of the island is covered by this ice cap. It's a cold-based glaciation. The ice the temperatures are so cold that the ice is really just sitting there, not moving at all. And it's only in very localized places where, under gravity, the ice is flowing in the form of uh, streaming ice, just like you have at the edge of the Antarctic ice cap today. And where the ice picks up enough speed in an ice stream, and when it contacts the bedrock, it starts digging into it. So all of a sudden here, you have this dramatic increase in depth from no erosion almost by ice on the plateau 
and all of a sudden this huge canyon that's opened up. Next slide. Um, you end up with mazes, and you also can see here this is a case where you still have some ice left in this V-shaped valley, which also goes counter to this notion that glacial valleys are U-shaped. You probably all learned it. Anyway, this is what's happening. We see today in Antarctica even. The Antarctic ice cap is mostly frozen to the ground, not doing much to it, not really accumulating moraines or anything. It's just sitting there. It's just piles and piles and miles and miles of ice. Uh, but locally, the ice picks up momentum and is streaming out. Here, it can be moving, in the case of Antarctica, up to 300 meters a year. Okay. Otherwise, the rest of the ice cap of Antarctica doesn't move by more than a meter a year. Uh, so you can see that there's actually an order of magnitude, in fact, two orders of magnitude more uh, erosional power when you are dealing with an ice stream. So this is what you end up having once the ice is gone. You have a landscape of selective linear erosion. This is a glaciology term. The terrain is mostly unaffected all around. That's why the erosion is selective. And where it's selective, it's linear because it's really going down a flow. And it's actually a reflection of something like this in the past. A very dynamic environment, glacially, but locally only. So this terrain was actually covered just eight to 10,000 years ago by about two miles of ice. Who would know? And the message here is you land at the Viking site see just about that with some sand blown in, you can't exclude the fact that you could be looking at a coal-based glacial landscape. Even. And it goes into this idea that you have to consider multiple hypotheses. Finally, there are analogy gullies as well. I won't go into that because they really pertain to modern times, uh, but they have analogs for different types of gallery gullies on Mars. Everything on the right here is dead. Everything on the left is Mars. Next slide. Okay, but uh, just to give you a quick summary, they do not involve water coming up from the ground. They don't involve ice from the ground melting out. Uh, these are all glacial in origin or the result of snow melt. It's meteoric, in other words, it's a completely superficial process. It doesn't involve much interaction with the subsurface. All of these different types of gullies are the same in that sense. Finally, ancient lake beds. Okay, we landed at Gusev Crater with the MER rovers, hoping to see lake beds. And we didn't quite see or identify lake beds. What we saw were lots of blocks of basalt. So doubt was cast on whether or not we had actually landed on a crater that was once occupied by the lake. And this whole idea has been essentially put in question throughout uh, since uh, the landing of the MER rovers. Sure enough, as, as Spirit drove on to um, Columbia Hills, it started finding hydrothermal deposits and other things like that. Uh, there's a story here with heat and volcanism, but still not much about, uh, about a lot of water ponding at this location. But the thing is, you might not be able to recognize especially at that scale, and especially if it involved glacial processes. This here is the floor of Halpin Crater. Okay. It's got blocks. You are very hard pressed to find any layering that would tell you that you're looking at a lake bed. The only thing that's telling you that you're looking at a lake bed, actually, is the fact that the soil between these blocks is extremely fine grain, it's silty, and of course if you actually start digging into it, cutting through it or going to the right place where you actually see the edge, then you will see the layering, the beautiful stratification of the lake beds. But here, you might be just preoccupied by the fact that these blocks uh, don't seem to be consistent with the lake. But that is not true. The reason why you have blocks in glacial lakes is because it's rocks that are falling all the time on frozen ice, on lake ice. And when the ice breaks up, the rocks are carried around, and when the ice eventually disappears or, or, or flips, the rocks are dumped onto the lake bed. And so glacial lake beds are typically very coarse. They are very much like that. So the good
good news for Natalie, maybe, is that this is still completely consistent with the link bank. And Natalie Cabral, who's one of the PIs at SET Institute on the MER team, and first suggested that Lucifer Crater might be a, a link bank, a paleo link bank. Uh, in other words, we have to be careful not to assess what we're seeing here based on what we're seeing on temperate climates. We have to really look at it from the standpoint of an analog that's really relevant, a climatic uh, analog that's relevant, and in this case, the glacial lake. Next slide. Okay, there's ground ice, plenty of it on Mars, in the Arctic as well. I'll skip over this. Skip over this. Drop glacial as well. So the cold reality of Mars goes this way. The implicit assumption in all of this is that the flow was under open air, okay, that you had standing on bodies that were open bodies of water. It's open, open, open. That's the basic assumption. That's the basic problem. What has been overlooked and dismissed, other than the major issues we saw earlier, are that the highland craters are much less weathered than craters on Earth. That uh, you also find the valley networks on young volcanoes. How would you form valley networks on young volcanoes uh, if it somehow quite a very thick and warm atmosphere. If it's, on the other hand, due to melting underneath ice cover, it makes total sense. Volcanoes spew out water, which, once it's spewed out into a cold Martian atmosphere, freezes onto the flanks of the volcanoes. Meanwhile, the ground of the volcanoes is warm, and so the ice melts from below. That's why all these volcano flanks are covered by mountain networks. Angular basaltic blocks or the flow of Gusev are consistent actually with, with a nice cover and a, and a lake. Um, the northern lowlands show a considerable amount of infilling. It's very unlikely actually that you had an ocean there as much as you might have had uh, frozen mud ponds as we see actually in the Arctic. Okay, so a very uh, sludgy uh, pool of sediment soaked with water possibly, but uh, an open ocean like we somehow want to invoke uh, is, is unlikely. And the fact that we see shorelines doesn't tell you anything because there are all kinds of ways of forming shorelines in our Arctic environments from the fact that ice can, uh, if it's even racking very slightly, can butt against the coast. So the bottom line is, uh, it might be an overstatement to say the cold reality, but it's the cold alternative. There is. There is no clear implication from what we see on Mars that somehow it was due only possibly to a warm weather climate. Uh, Mars have, may have been always uh, cold, and that actually would make the life of climate modelers a lot easier. You don't have to invoke the 2 to 10 bar atmosphere anymore. Uh, problem solved. It's all consistent with the faint early sun paradox. Uh, and it works, works pretty nicely. Next slide. There's also the story of life. Uh, the fact that we might suggest that Mars was always cold throughout its history. It doesn't mean that you are less likely to find life. Uh, life actually is teeming in the Arctic, even in a landscape like this. You can just cut open any one of these rocks or lift them, and you will see that there are colonies of cyanobacteria, for example, colonizing the inside of the rocks or uh, colonizing the asperity at the bottom of the rock. Uh, so uh, from, from the standpoint of a microbe, Mars is, is still a very a wonderful opportunity as long as there is something we wanted to contend with throughout Martian history. That's what we're seeing. The other thing that's really uh, exciting about this and part of our lessons learned from, from the years on Devon is that impacts are usually thought of as bad news for life. You have an impact, okay, it kills the dinosaurs, we we're not expecting it. Okay. But for microbes, impacts are a fantastic opportunity, especially on early Earth. This is a piece of uh, granite, in fact, with nice, uh, from the base of Devon Island. So it's two and a half billion years old. Granites and ices were part of the earliest rocks that were formed on the Earth. They're very compact, they're crystalline, uh, they result from magmatic processes, and not a lot of pore spaces in them. People who have found cyanobacteria living in sandstones in Antarctica are able to find them because sandstones are very porous, not only that translucent. So if you cut open a sandstone from Antarctica, you will find cyanobacteria inside. In granites, nice on the Earth, you never find cyanobacteria. It's too compact, the minerals are too dark, too opaque, too lost sunlight. But once they have been shocked by the impact, the rock is now crushed. Minerals have been vaporized from within. All of a sudden, you have a spongy texture. 
the translucence of the minerals has also changed. And sure enough, you will find cyanobacteria colonies inside shocked crystalline rocks. And so the message here is, is sort of intriguing. Early Earth, in spite of the fact that it might not have had sandstones uh, right from the get-go, it certainly had impacts into granites and gneisses. It had uh, certain well, granites in particular. And uh, impacts, therefore, were creators of habitats for, for microbial colonies on the early Earth. Uh, and, and of course, uh, bringers of heat as well, stirs of water. Next slide. So this is not really a Mars analog, other than the fact that uh, for many years, it was believed that there was nothing preserved of Halton's ejective blanket. And what we have found over the past two summers are these collapsed ledges and piles of layered rocks. If you look up close, they are actually all sheared, uh, fluidized. They are actually remnants of the ejective blanket. They were somewhat higher in the past, but you can see that they're sitting on blocks that have slowly sunken into the ground or collapsed and tilted over time uh, and been buried, in fact, by other things coming from above. Uh, but it's actually quite spectacular. We're very excited because this is allowing us now to put an upper limit on how much erosion has taken place at this site since the impact formed. It, obviously, if you couldn't see any impact ejecta, you could have imagined the whole landscape has been eroded down by 100 to 200 meters, which some people have published. Uh, but now that we actually find remnants of the impact ejector blanket, uh, that puts a, a nail in the coffin of a lot of erosion taking place on that site. Sure enough, there wasn't much. So, how much time do I have left? Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> so this will be a topic for another day, basically. But let's do this real quick. Mission to Mars is about sending a group of humans on a three-year journey from Florida to a lethal frozen desert, <laughs> a thousand times farther than the moon, have them be productive explorers and bring them back safely to Earth. Okay. This is the Earth, moon distance to scale, by the way. And imagine what the Apollo astronauts did. Next slide. So there are many ways to go to Mars. We don't have to go into those details. And this is what all the presidents in recent years have said about going to Mars. Uh, in his inaugural speech, uh, Lyndon Johnson said, with might happen in a short span of years. Uh, President Nixon said eventually. Uh, Terry Ford said uh, we should contemplate the, the Viking mission and reflect on our journey into the Vietnam. Let's think about it. Uh, Jimmy Carter <coughs> was quite happy with just remote cameras and we'll see Mars. We don't have to go there. Uh, Ronald Reagan actually was very much behind the space station, of course, uh, but he saw it as a base camp. This base camp theme comes, comes up in several of his speeches. Statements. Uh, he saw it as a springboard, if you will, to, to the planets, including Mars. And so on. Reagan also said this, which I think is interesting. Somewhere in America, there is alive today a small child who one day may be the first man or woman to ever set foot on the planet Mars, or to inhabit it, or to inhabit a permanent base on the moon. This was in '88, so the child is born in '88. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have until 2060 or so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so All right. George Bush Sr. talked about going to Mars, but it was clearly back to the moon first, back to the future, and then a journey into tomorrow, so that was left quite open. President Clinton never mentioned anything about a new mission to Mars, only that uh, he's put in place a solid robotic exploration program for Mars, which is true. Uh, the, the latest Bush administration uh, did mention, of course, going to Mars. Uh, but actually, interestingly, in, in George Bush's speeches, there, were never, there was never actually a date for that. It was going to the moon and then be ready to take the next steps. Okay, next slide. Uh, and then, of course, recently, on April 15th, uh, the current president uh, stated that by the mid-2030s, I believe we can send humans to orbit Mars and return them safely to Earth. And landing on Mars will follow, and I expect around to see it. So that's another constraint. <laughs> if you translate that into actual years, next slide, uh, this is what we're up against. 2017, sort of middle of this coming decade, crewed flights to test and prove deep space exploration systems, straight out of speech. Uh, 2025, by then, first crewed deep space mission astronauts to an asteroid. Okay. 
that just seems to be far off to me because that's you know 15 years from now. We really need 15 years before we can send a human to an asteroid. I hope we can do that sooner. Uh, 2035 was the deadline uh, President Obama gave for humans to orbit Mars. And then, since he wants to be around to see the humans land on Mars, and it happens after the Mars orbit, I think it give it six years, two or three Mars windows, that's really little. Uh, 2041, all right. Who'll be around? <laughs> okay, in the meantime, uh, we're looking at Exploration Precursor Robotic Mission as an exciting thing, and of course, humans to Mars orbit really means that they will have a chance to explore Phobos and Deimos. Next slide. Uh, so, next. I had a few things to mention to you about missions that we've been working on that are actually unrelated to the Help Mars project, like the Discovery Mission proposal that we just submitted with Tom Jones of the SETI Institute as, as PI. Uh, but this is a, an interesting mission that we're proposing that would land uh, on a uh, C-type triple near an asteroid. So land on at least two of its components. If I do uh, a number of good science, resolve a number of good science issues. But I'm running out of time, so I'll just skip this. Next slide. <laughs> uh, this is President Obama looking at Phobos with Buzz Aldrin. So Phobos is on his radar. <laughs> and the reason we're interested in Phobos, of course, is because they're fantastic platforms in orbit around Mars. Uh, and also they have they are very intriguing bodies. In fact, I find it uh, I find them to be one of the most vexing problems that we still have left to resolve in the solar system. Exploration. Yeah. We know where Venus came from, and, you know what Mars is like. We have some basic understanding of how these worlds evolved. Phobos and Deimos are still total mysteries. Uh, I mean, they are surmised as being captured asteroids, but the capture process is, is difficult. It requires maybe atmospheric drag. When Mars was had a thicker atmosphere of young and life, uh, it's unclear where they came from. And the other thing is, are they related? Uh, Phobos is drifting inwards because it's below the uh, geostationary orbit, if you will, of Mars, so it's tidally getting, uh, uh, well, it's losing angular momentum, basically, and, and uh, sinking towards Mars. Deimos, on the other hand, is, ah. is involved in a way, okay? and the two bodies actually look quite different. So, what are they? Are they captive asteroids? Are they actually remnants from the formation of Mars? Are they anything else. Might they even be common to a nuclear that are captured in this one. So this is how close Phobos actually is to Mars to scale. And uh, I've been working on a mission which we hope to propose the next new, front, next, uh, new frontiers opportunity in about two or three years uh, called HAL. It's a Phobos and Demo sample return mission. Next slide. That's a picture of humans exploring Phobos which will be really exciting if we can have this happen uh, hopefully before 2035. It will really be very exciting. People who think that going to Mars and not landing on Mars would be a waste of time, I think, to rethink the problem because it would be very exciting to go to Phobos and Mars. Next slide. So uh, why, how, and who should go? Uh, next. So this is why. This is a comprehensive list that you might have seen before as to why we need to go. And the bottom line, and this one I added actually recently after a visit to Australia when somebody suggested to me <laughs> establish a new colony of prisoners and convicts. Okay, but the bottom line is for all these good reasons that might that you might vibrate with or relate to personally, none of these count. The only thing that counts in exploration by governments is whether or not it serves national interest. That's been true throughout history. If we will not send humans to Mars once somehow robots are running out of steam and humans are decidedly better. We're not going to go to Mars if we find life on Mars. It's, okay, those are not the reason we will go to Mars. The reason we'll go to Mars is if it serves national interest. Cook was sent to the South Pacific uh, because, not because the British Navy was interested in botany, but because uh, the French were there. Okay. We went to the moon with high gear with Apollo, not because all of a sudden in the 60s we were interested in lunar geology. Uh, we went there because the Russians might make it there. And so, and so it's the same thing. It, it served national interest. And that was the imperative that made 
these things happen. So I would contend that all these are reasonably good reasons, and maybe a combination of them will amount to serving national interest. Uh, but uh, that's what needs to be satisfied. This is somewhat academic. Uh, one of my favorite reasons to go to Mars uh, and have a program uh, like the Apollo program is what it did to education in this country. This is a NSF uh, plot showing the number of PhDs in science and engineering versus time. And you can see from the early 60s to 1972 this huge ramp up, which was the stimulation provided by the Apollo program, uh, the excitement that we convey. And after that, okay, we entered the computer age, which had its own pump, which is huge. But uh, there's no doubting that something like the Apollo program uh, is a powerful tool on this slide. Uh, so this is another statement by the president actually made earlier uh, this year. If we want to get to Mars, we want to get beyond that. What kinds of technologies are going to be necessary in order for us to make sure that folks can get there in one piece and get back in one piece? that the kinds of fuels that we use and the technologies we use are going to facilitate something that is actually feasible. Are we, and we're very excited about the possibilities of putting more research dollars into the, some of these transformational technologies. So this is just a, a candid statement, I guess. So if you need to leave, uh, by all means, uh, please do so. Uh, but let me run through this. How are we going to go to Mars? The big question is not so much getting there. You can cross the Atlantic in a submarine or a blimp, okay? Uh, but what are you going to do in America? Well, what are you going to do on Mars? We have to work out what the requirements are at the surface of Mars before we can understand what we need to prepare for the next slide. Uh, how are we going to make discoveries? How will we uh, capture the discovery? material, samples, next slide. What types of tools will we use? What types of vehicles should we have? What kind of autonomy should we count on? Next slide. So one fantastic advantage that Devon Island offers you is that you have this real estate that's the size of West Virginia with uh, even fewer people in West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> no infrastructure, no power lines, no roads, uh, nothing. Uh, to even guide you, nothing for scale in the landscape, not a tree, not a house. You can't tell that mountain sometimes is a mile away or two miles or three miles away. Right? So one of the work, one of the aspects we've been focusing on with Hamilton Sunstrand, the maker of space suits, is in creating new technologies that are incorporated into the suit to inform you about your surroundings. When you are floating in space, in the space, around the space station, next slide, you don't need a lot of information about where you are. You, of course, might have a checklist reminding you what you need to get done. You are in a very controlled environment, very similar to what you're practicing in the swimming pool. But let's go back one slide. On Mars or on the Moon, well, this one's fine. Uh, you are talking about exploring. You have to interface with the terrain, with the unknown, all the time. Uh, you need tools to display your location, help you navigate, uh, manage your resources, your oxygen those of your buddies, et cetera. So how do you display this information? You can't have everything on a, you know, a checklist on your wrist. So with Hamilton Substrate, we're focusing on all kinds of interfaces to allow information to be exchanged between the astronauts on the ground and between the ground and the Earth. Is that an iPad then? Uh, no, <laughs> it's not an iPad. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, interesting idea, and thank you for suggesting <laughs> <laughs> uh, This is a study that was done this summer, an immune study on folks at our camp who were there for the full uh, seven weeks of the flu season. Uh, we were donating our blood to allow uh, <laughs> cells to be counted and all kinds of other hormones that are associated with stress. I'm sure that the result that they will find is that we're a lot more stressed out before we go and after we come back than while we are there. While we're there, we're in heaven. Uh, Devon Island has also been used in recent years, actually, for planning lunar exploration. And I just want to show you why, real quick, how the crate is actually exactly the same size uh, 
about five maybe a kilometer uh, as traffic from crater at the South Pole to Northern Sixth. That's where NASA wanted to set up an outpost. Uh, it was really a, a good place to do, how it was a good place to do lunar simulations, looks like. Uh, so this is just a comparison of the slide. So the topography is, is relevant. Uh, this, the line of uh, sense of distance as well, next slide. We actually have permanently shadowed valleys. There are some valleys on Devon Island that never see the disk of the sun. Of course, they bathe in diffuse light from, from the atmosphere, but they don't actually see the disk of the sun. Next slide. Uh, and one of the major activities we've had over the past uh, few years was with Terry Farms group at NASA Inc. and uh, is uh, K-10 rovers. Uh, so here are the rovers uh, being deployed in the field under the field leadership of Matt Deans. Next slide. So these are folks on the Intelligent Robotics Group. And they had a very interesting experiment this summer, which was to use robots, robotic rovers, not as a scouting tool, but as a tool to follow up behind the exploration of humans. How would robotic rovers be used uh, in the wake of, say, an Apollo uh, type of survey of a site? So last summer, we had <coughs> two geologists who were not familiar with the site, visited with limited time, wearing spacesuits. Conducting EBAs, learning whatever they could about the site. And then this year we had robotic rovers go behind them, uh, follow up on their work, and, and complement that activity. And it was very productive. Of course, we could learn many lessons. And the answer is you can do a lot with follow up as well, of course. Next slide. <laughs> this is just to show you uh, K10 with K9. <laughs> Uh, this was an experiment that continues to be conducted. Uh, it started many years ago. We've been using the Humvee as, of course, as a pressurized rover simulator. But part of the uh, realization that we, we've been having is that you can, if you afford it sufficient visibility, you can actually use a rover as the actual tool that, uh, that you want to stay in uh, to explore your surroundings. You don't have to go on EVA every time you need to pick up a rock. If only you had an arm, a robotic arm that could do that for you. And certainly you can make all kinds of very interesting and important observations by just maneuvering around this terrain in, in, a, in a relatively large vehicle. So we have a pressurized rover on the moon on Mars. Uh, I think that will do many things. It will cut down, uh, in particular dramatically, on the number of EVA hours that you need to, spacesuit hours that you need to, to plan on. Which is good because they are resource intensive, uh, somewhat dangerous, of course, uh, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, we also used uh, this vehicle as a pressurized rover, but instrumented in, in order to integrate the instruments in a cheap way onto the Humvee. We just put the K-10 rover on its roof uh, and use the K-10's instruments uh, to, uh, to basically capture information. Next slide. So here we are. Uh, next slide. Uh, other research experiments going on. Uh, Brian Glass has been developing a robotic drill uh, with his team for the past several years. And you have to realize the challenge, a fantastic achievement as well with this team. They have been able to develop uh, drilling technology. It's mainly software that allows you to control uh, when to apply pressure, when not, when to let go, when to raise the drill train, when to uh, continue for drilling, how much torque to apply. All of this robotically, automatically with just software controlling it. And of course, the software is responding to input uh, from the vibration modes of this drill, this, uh, drill strain. And there are lasers that are essentially bouncing off of this drill train, and depending on the vibration frequencies of your, of your drilling strain, uh, you will respond accordingly. If, uh, if you feel that there's an impending failure, you will detect that and stop drilling. And so this is, drilling is a very much of an art for those who actually do drilling in the field, and being able to roboticize the whole process is, is, is really uh, extraordinary. So Brian has been able to uh, work this problem. All of this by operating a drill that uses no more than uh, 100 watts to, to drill. So that's what powers your light bulb, basically. All right. Of course, uh, one of our main focuses or focus for side has been the uh, mobility systems. Uh, on Mars, you can only go so far with a solution like this, which is, of course, mimicking what we have for Apollo. Uh, next slide. Uh, what you really want is a pressurized rover. 
okay, something you can live in, live in, work in, sleep in, and then you go outside and you live to the next life. So uh, back in 2003, we had a sponsorship from AM General, the maker of Humvees, and took a Humvee to Devon Island by driving it across the sea ice uh, in the winter, since it does not fit in a twin arm. <laughs> <laughs> And over the years, we've been driving it around uh, on simulated uh, pressurized rover traverses uh, with more or less fidelity uh, across this landscape. This slide. We've also used it uh, on the cable. We haven't actually used it, but we rehearsed using it as an ambulance. Uh, so this is our hospital tent. Uh, the cross was added later, but uh, the, it just shows you how you can back into the it's originally a military ambulance, of course, so, so it has bunks inside. It can be used as a hospital extension, it's like. And nowadays, we also use this Humvee as a, as a place to store our food, because we used to store our food like this. At the end of the summer, we had some leftover food. We would not leave it in the tents, of course. We store it outside, away from the tents, because polar bears might visit. For several years, we had no problems. The food was stored in cooler, the coolers were tarped, the tarps were covered with rocks and strapped. But uh, three years ago, when we showed up, next slide, this is what we saw. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. So this was really the uh, bear. bad news. And not only that, but next slide, uh, we noticed the polar bears must have gone through coffee jars as well. So they were polar bears on caffeine. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, that was, but the tents at least were left untouched, more or less. Okay, and so since then, next slide, we use our Humvee <laughs> as the food storage, but you can see that it's still being uh, visited in the winter, next slide. This is the door of the Humvee. This is an armored door, okay. Uh, pride by a claw, next slide. We also use the vehicle to test out uh, technologies for uh, pressurized rovers like the, the Desert Rats uh, SEV, the, the spacecraft, sorry, the space exploration vehicle. Uh, but the problem with having just one Humvee is that it's dangerous. If you if you get stuck, uh, well, your stomach sinks to the ground for one thing, but then you you might be really stuck there for quite a while. And so we've been going on our excursions usually with the support of scouting ATVs. But the real solution on Mars and on the Moon in the future is to have more than one Humvee on uh, So this solution actually is still good to allow you to go locally. Uh, so you might want to have robotic ATVs following your pressurized rovers. You can hop on them and go, to, go for local excursions. Like. So these are your little lifeboats, if you will, compared to your ATVs, which are your ships. Okay. And your ATV allows you to get up to an outcrop uh, and do some sampling and get really close and therefore spare uh, the oxygen that you're using up on hiking or the next slide. But the problem with uh, Humvees and big pressurized rovers is that it, they can get stuck. They can be stuck on very rough terrain or they can be stuck on very soft terrain like on sand or <coughs> Mars. And it's not an academic problem. Next slide. It shows you uh, the NER rover is struggling with uh, sand on Mars. And Steve Squires will tell you the story of how uh, the first rover that got stuck, uh, Opportunity, I think, got eventually unstuck. It got stuck in sand. This is Opportunity being shown here. And of course, the first thing they did was to put on the committee to, to examine the problem. Uh, so, the August committee uh, met for weeks, and then they decided to, to also use the sandbox at JPL with a spare rover to test out this procedure that they had come up with to extract opportunity from its predicament. And they wrote a report, they made the recommendation, it was analyzed, approved, and they implemented the procedure. And sure enough, the MER got unstuck. Okay. And the procedure was apparently, as Steve Squires puts it, uh, put it in reverse and gun it. <laughs> but uh, the truth is, you could really get stuck, and we got stuck on Devon Island with mud. You had to winch yourself out. Uh, 
sand on Mars will be the killer. I repeat, sand on Mars will be the killer. And uh, it's, there's no question about it. So we really have to be prepared for this kind of uh, situation. Next slide. So rather than having one pressurized rover explore this Martian landscape in the future, we're envisioning two. It could be the moon as well. Uh, the idea of, of being two is that one can, of course, extract the other from trouble. And of course, three would be even better. Next slide. That's why Columbus went to the American three ships. Uh, so how, how to get a second Humvee to Devon Island was our challenge. We managed to convince AM General to give us another one. Uh, in fact, they extracted it from Hollywood. It had spent his whole life in Hollywood, not, not in the battlefield. Uh, but we had to uh, drive it to Devon Island. So we decided to be creative about it, and we wanted to drive the Northwest Passage. So this is the Northwest Passage. Next slide. Devon Island being up there. So we would take it from this piece of land here at the mouth of the Northwest Passage to Cambridge Bay, then on to Joe Haven, then on to Resolute Bay, and then on to Devon Island and HMP Camp. That was the plan. Next slide. What we ended up being able to do, because the ice was so rough, was we were able to get to Cambridge Bay. 500 kilometers were covered here. But then we had to fly it uh, to Resolute Bay on the C-130. And then we recently, this year, wrote, drove it from Resolute Bay uh, to Devon Island. Next slide. So uh, I won't go into a lot of detail, but just to show you what we've done with the second Humvee, this was the first part of the expedition, uh, the Northwest Passage, uh, we looked up to Cambridge Bay. Next slide. Next slide. So three pictures. We got snowstormed in. Uh, at some point, this, the weather cleared. We were happy. <laughs> uh, we continued. So we were driving on sea ice all this time, and then uh, on two days before the end of the traverse, we actually fell through a lead. This is a artist reconstruction of what happened. Basically, the lead was completely covered by snow and ice and some broken ice. So you can see it. The front made it across, but not the back. And so we all of a sudden started sinking, uh, but we were able to winch ourselves out uh, by anchoring steel bars which we conveniently brought along uh, into the sea ice and then uh, pulled ourselves out. Next slide. So this is the journey of the first expedition of last year, uh, 500 kilometers. Next slide. Uh, there was quite a bit of science that was done during that traverse. We did an astrobiology study for example. We sampled the snow upstream, sorry, uh, up track, down track, upwind, downwind from the <coughs> of the vehicle to look for any contamination that we might have put in the 51 hour environment. And the study was published last year, next slide, by Andy Sherga and myself. And the answer is good news, it's, 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 it's barely detectable and it's detectable only in one or two circumstances. So uh, the human impact, even in an environment as uh, terrestrial as this, is, is completely minimal in this environment. Extremely low levels of dispersal reserve for human associated microbes into a local pristine terrain during the summer day of the universe. The title is the abstract. <laughs> uh, but what was five kilo 500 kilometers? Well, that's the equivalent map here uh, uh, of a drive from the crater of Eris Poscanes on the moon to the Apollo 15 landing site along the Apennine Mountains. Next slide. We've logged a lot of data about consumption of uh, consumables, and uh, I'll just skip over this. And then this year, we wrapped up the Northwest Passage Drive by doing this final crossing, which proved to be really hairy. It took us four days, basically, to cover 40 kilometers. Uh, and in fact, we just got stuck three days here. So part of the breaking, the ice was extremely rough, and at some point, we had to send out two skidoos ahead of ourselves to our camp to scavenge a part off of the red humpy uh, to rescue the yellow one. <laughs> and that right there was an illustration of the value of having two vehicles. This one. So this is our yellow humpy, the moon one, and a white out. Uh, driving uh, at midnight towards the north. Midnight. That's one of our problems that we have. We have to, we 
repair here in this valley for a few days. Here we are moving along. Then we sank through sea ice again. Same situation, covered by snow. This time we had a rear winch, uh, and so we were able to pull ourselves backwards. Next time. Then one of the tracks flipped by getting uh, hooked on a piece of ice that would not yield. That's bad news. So we had two replacement tracks. We ended up using both, and that was it. We made it. But had we had another problem, we would have been in a pickle. Next slide. And then this other track got ripped when it got caught under this chunk of ice. This is actually ice here. You can't really tell. That's why we ran into it. Next slide. There you go. That's very bad news. So that's where we had to send the two snowmobiles ahead of us to camp to get the, the same part from the, from the Red Humble. Next slide. There they go. Of course, while they were gone, it took two and a half days this next slide. Uh, we were left without snowmobiles on a impaired vehicle, in an impaired vehicle in the middle of nowhere. In fact, we weren't alone. Next slide. Uh, <laughs> bears started showing up. At first, they were not looking at us. They were just going around sniffing. And then next slide. <laughs> so we stayed mostly indoors. <laughs> When we repaired and left, sure enough, we crossed the polar bear tracks. So they were going around in circles around our camp. Anyway, the rough was very rough, especially towards the end. Uh, this is the approach to Devon Island. So we had to winch the Humvee through all this, uh, in fact, uh, seven or eight times until we got to the coast. Next slide. So that's how we left the vehicle in May, once we got there, and then this is how we recovered the vehicle in the summer. And you can see we replaced the tracks with tires for, for land operations. Next slide. All right, so we're very near the end here. Uh, this is a concept pressurized rover that's being tested by NASA. It's, it used to be called FRED, and then it was called uh, the SPR, the Small Pressurized Rover. That was called the Lunar Electric Rover. It all depends on who's funding you. <laughs> and now it's called the Space Exploration Vehicle, SP, Surface Exploration Vehicle. But what this particular picture shows you is the other major problem that we're going to have with for exploration on Mars and the Moon is dust. After just a few days of driving, the whole vehicle was covered in dust in Arizona. Uh, next slide. There's plenty of dust on Devon, too. And so the solution here is. Uh, is to look at a way to do your spacesuit work without bringing the dust into the cabin. The Apollo astronauts were going back inside the lunar module after every space walk. Okay? In this mode of exploration, your spacesuits are connected to the back wall of the vehicle. You climb into the spacesuit from the inside, and you just latch off to walk off onto, onto the surface. And when you're done with your spacewalk, you sort of step back into your note. Uh, and then you open your spacesuit backpack and you climb back out. So this way the spacesuit stays outside at all times, and of course there are solutions to maintain it and fix it if you have to uh, in some circumstances. But this is the nominal way of using things like. So this is, I was actually a crew member on the first field test of this uh, rover with the spacesuit dangling outside. This was the commander, there were just two, but the commander. Uh, <laughs> He's a veteran shuttle astronaut um, and uh, head of the uh, EVA office uh, at this time. Anyway, uh, this shows you how you enter the spacesuit uh, by opening the double back doors. Uh, one is tied to the backpack, the other one is tied to the vehicle. And you climb into your suit, uh, you close the back door, and then you, you walk off. It's like so we've been installing uh, spacesuits and suit ports at the back of our Humvee since last year, and are are sort of helping NASA and helping Sunstrand to make your spacesuits design uh, better suit ports to to allow this type of approach. So this is Mark Helper for from last year. He was a geologist. Remember one of those guys who had never seen the site? Comes there. 
looking at rocks, he's interested in something he wants to go grab it. So now he's going to climb into the suit and walk off. Okay, so this past summer, we had two suits installed. The latest of the latest. <laughs> and uh, when the suits are not in, it can serve as a, as a doggy pen. All right. Finally, uh, who will go to Mars? Okay, so crew size has to be small, five to eight people. Uh, therefore, cross training has to be essential. Okay. You cannot take an army of specialties like you have on a Navy ship. Uh, you have to have people who are really cross trained in different uh, things because you're so limited how many people can go. Uh, as far as the crew selection criteria goes, go. Should you have a gender mix? Should you have an ethnic mix? Should you have an international mix? Should you have a marital mix? Should you have husband and wives? Okay. I think some people would find that fine, and other people find that really scary. <laughs> uh, in small crews, performance depends centrally on the individual selected. So all of these are actually strictly political decisions. Whether you want to send a gender mix or not, whether you want an ethnic mix, whether you want an international mix, whether you want an American mix, that's strictly the political decision has nothing to do with the performance of the crew. In small crews, the performance depends centrally on the individual that you select. Uh, what you do need are people who are Renaissance people, who are multiply trained and able in many areas to cover different expertises that are needed. And you also need seasoned astronauts. It's very likely to find young people who have had time to become experience in a lot of things. Experience by definition takes time. So these are the key traits uh, based on our experience here in the polar regions over the years uh, of how you might pick a crew member to go with you on, a, on an expedition to the poles or possibly to Mars. Number one is that you want to pick the person for their expertise and the knowledge of your brain. That's really key. The experience, the specific ability, the specific skill sets. They don't have to be nice. They can be marginally healthy, even. Uh, they, they can be a pain. But you'd rather have a Scotty on your crew that you don't get along with, but he's on your crew, uh, than somebody that you're really fond, fond about but uh, cannot fix the ship. Okay. So, knowledge is really key. Health has to be physical and mental. Motivation, you have to be really dedicated to mission success. You have to be adaptable. By that we mean tolerant of others, tolerant to change, tolerant to stress. Uh, the most common complaint I hear from people who are not very experienced uh, in polar regions is, well, I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> well, we've got news for you, we did. <laughs> we just didn't know. And we try to, to brief them ahead of time, to, to offer planning uh, meetings and to explain how uh, the plan is a plan and what happens is something that we, that's going to be different. Uh, but it doesn't sink in until you sort of are faced with that sometimes. Finally, you need to be altruistic. You have to demonstrate unselfish behavior. It's really important. Uh, you can't just pretend you're altruistic. You, know, you have to be altruistic. You have to really care for your companion, for your buddy. Uh, you have to look after each other. So here are some good quotes. I think I will leave you with those. In no department can a leader spend time more profitably than in the selection of the men. This was in 1912, so we give it sexism, but of the men who are to accomplish the work. And here's another quote from Douglas Mawson. Uh, Fiala, as a result of his Arctic experience, truly says, Many a man who is jolly, who is a jolly good fellow in congenial surroundings will become impatient, selfish, and mean when obliged to sacrifice his comfort, curb his desires, and work hard in what seems a losing fight. The first consideration of the choice of men for a polar campaign should be the moral quality. Very British, but it's like. All right, uh, I think I just have two more. Uh, we're going to asteroids next, so our site will still be useful in that regard. Next slide. We're thinking of having, for example, a blimp, a tethered blimp, serve as a comms relay to simulate a spacecraft uh, floating around an asteroid and go to some of this very uh, difficult terrain that we have, small radius of curvatures. So 
or radar curvature to, to simulate the, the terrain of an asteroid to do field work. Next slide. That's it. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, you said that uh, life could exist on a cold Mars in the cracks and fractures and things like that. But don't extremophiles on Earth uh, originate from life that uh, was developed in a more benign environment? And so would it not be more likely that life would never have existed at all on Mars? You know, that's, that's not very clear at all, I, I don't think. First of all, a lot of the more primitive bugs that we are aware of, the archaea, actually tend to be specialized. Uh, and very uh, more narrowly adapted than the universal bugs that are floating all over the place. The halophiles, the methanophiles, all of these uh, files uh, <laughs> are thought of something specific. Uh, and so it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hazard to guess that somehow uh, you, you need a, a specialized environment for, I mean, that, that, you, that the earliest bugs were unspecialized. They might actually have been specialized. But there are more competent people maybe here that can answer that question. If you want to. Yeah. One more question. When you look at Mars, you see a highly cratered portion of it, and then you see this well resurfaced area. Usually we've been told it was an ocean. Do yep. you think it might have been a glacier? Did it? Well, I, I think an ocean is one possibility, just taken alone. Uh, but an ocean requires a warm climate and a thick atmosphere. What's possible are what we were uh, does, uh, sort of comparing them to uh, the mud pools. There are vast areas of the Arctic that are essentially soaked in water. They're essentially vast mud ponds. Uh, and they, they don't hold topography very well. So if you had an impact crater in that over time, it would just you know, lose itself away. Uh, and they get crusted with ice in the, in the winter. Uh, the ice can move if, uh, depending on how, how the melting takes place. You can create pseudo shorelines of sorts. So you, you can have all the traits that we're seeing here that are making us call it an ocean are actually possibly attributable to other processes. And a mud, a mud pool would be one of these. That's an awful lot of mud pool. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but then again, you might be talking with uh, a lot of mud, a lot of dirt. Uh, and uh, what the Mar Margarita Marinova is coming, I think, uh, in a few weeks to give a talk on the origin of the Martian dichotomy. There's a big difference in altitude between the northern hemisphere and the south. Okay? Uh, and the, the going idea is that it's, it was a giant impact early in Mars's history. So that explains the depression. The fact that you have this difference in altitude between the highlands of the south and the northern hemisphere could be the result of a giant early impact on Mars. It wouldn't have split the end of the whole planet apart? No, no. I mean, would it have been noticed, but otherwise. <laughs> but, but the thing is, once you have the depression, then the, the northern lowlands become the place where everything that gets uh, weathered, dumped, or thrown up in the sky uh, gets essentially deposited over time. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of grit there. So I could see, I could see a, a marshy Northern hemisphere of sorts, you know, not marshy in the tropical sense, but marshy in the sort of muddy sense. Uh, but not necessarily this ocean that's such a terrestrial image of ponding water. Okay. Yep. If you have any more questions, if you could uh, come and approach Pascal now. Uh, and uh, yeah, as you mentioned, Margarita's coming up, and we have Chris McKay next week at back at Symantec last week that we have before we move to our new offices. So join me in thanking Pascal.